Hi, and welcome to the 17th Annual Food Justice Summit. My name is Enrique Orozco, and I am one of the co-organizers of the summit this year. Before we start your session, I want to highlight some of the accessibility options, engagement features, and explain how to access interpretation services. Hola, y bienvenido a la 17 Cumbre Anual de la Justicia Alimentaria de Chicago. Me llamo Enrique Orozco y soy uno de los coordinadores de la cumbre este año. Antes de empezar, quiero tomar un momento para indicar las opciones de accesibilidad, las herramientas de participación y los servicios de interpretación. Para acceder a los servicios de interpretación, fíjase al lado derecho de su pantalla. Al hacer clic en la pestaña de interpretación, se abrirá una ventana. Haga clic en Select y luego elija el lenguaje de su preferencia, inglés o español. Seguidamente, haga clic en Connect para comenzar a escuchar al intérprete. Finalmente, debería silenciar el video principal para no escuchar a los presentadores e intérpretes. To access interpretation services, look at the right side of your screen. By clicking on the interpretation tab, you will open a box, click on select, and then choose which language you would like to hear, English or Spanish. Then click on connect to begin hearing the interpreter. Finally, you will need to mute the main video to not hear the speakers and interpreters. The platform also number offers a number of visual accessibility tools. To find them, Click on the profile image at the bottom right of the screen, then select accessibility adjustments. You can also Under these change the language adjustments. Screen, you can select different up. options to make the website easier to read. We welcome you to participate in the conversation through the chat window. Clicking again on the chat tab on the right of your screen will open up this window. Select the box at the bottom of the page to begin typing into the chat. At the end of the session, we will open for a brief question and answer portion, and you may type your questions here. Finally, at the end, I invite you to open the polling tab on the right side of your screen to answer this short survey that lets our team know how well we did in planning this session. I hope you enjoy the 17th Annual Chicago Food Justice Summit. I will now turn it over to your speakers. All right, greetings everyone. Uh, I hope you are well today and we are honored to be in this space with you. I uh, want to give thanks to Chicago Food Policy Action Council for holding this great summit and for allowing us to, to also be speakers. I invite all of you, if you feel led to, to consider finding a comfortable space as we take a moment to just breathe and ground ourselves before this discussion. I am going to turn off my camera if you choose to do so, you are more than welcome to. Whatever makes you comfortable. I invite you to find a comfortable space, whether it's sitting down, whether it's lying down, or whether it's standing or something in between. Once again, if you feel led to, close your eyes and take your mind's eye in your conscious eye and move it to the center of your chest, maybe where your heart center is. I invite you to think of feelings of, of gratitude, whether whatever summons these feelings, be it family members, friends, loved ones, non-human companions, the sunshine memory of a beach, on a sunny day, allow that to conjure a warmth within your chest, near your heart center. 
and allow this to be visualized as gratitude. It asks that you focus that gratitude on your ancestors and all of those people and other energy sources that got you to this point today, here and now. I also want to acknowledge that some of this may have been through tragedy and circumstances that were not good, but perhaps even harmful. As we conjure these feelings of gratitude, once again, I ask you to acknowledge your ancestors and everything that got you to this point today. I invite you to also give thanks to yourself for being who you are beyond all the layers and masks that we're asked to wear every day for getting up today and for participating in this great life we have. And lastly, I ask you to extend gratitude and send gratitude to the future generations that are beyond us at this moment, beyond our current perception of them. I'd ask that you use this visualization, however you conjure it within yourself, to breathe in and out three times at your own pace with the thought of grounding yourself in receptivity and clarity as we begin this discussion. I'm gonna start now and invite you to do so. Breathe at your own pace. We'll do three inhales and exhales. When you're finished, I invite you to bring your attention back to your heart center. Remind yourself that your whole being is all of your being, not just your thoughts or your feelings, but all of it together. And to be mindful that our heart is part of that process. And I ask you to listen with an open heart, an open mind, and of course your ears and eyes, and however else you communicate. When you're ready, I invite you to bring your attention back to your eyes and this plane of existence. And then if you feel led to, to turn on your camera. Thank you. And with that, I will pass it over to my friend and comrade, Rihanna. Thank you so much, Cosmos. Um, and just before we move on, um, did you want to formally introduce yourself to everyone? Sure, pardon me. Um, I'm Cosmos or Cosmos Ray. I use he, him, L pronouns. Uh, I'm with Bronzeville Kenwood Mutual Aid. Thank you. Thanks, Cosmos. Um, and my name is Rhiannon and my pronouns are she, her, and I am with Logan Square Mutual Aid. And um, I know that SIFPAC uh, has included this in their materials, but would just like to do um, a land acknowledgement once again. Um, and so we would just like to acknowledge that Chicago, since time immemorial, was a center for trade and conviv conviviality. And we want to honor the original caretakers of this land, the Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Odawa and Potawatomi, and also um, the Miami, the Inoka, the Ho Chunk, the Menominee, and several other tribes. And the Chicagoland area is home to over 65,000 Native Americans, survivors of attempted genocide and forced displacement, and that despite it all, are still here protecting water, air, land, seeds, and stories for the next generations to come. Thank you. And I will pass it over to Graciela. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Buenas tardes. Um, I'm Graciela Guzman. My pronouns are she, hers, ella. 
uh, with Beaumont Cragen Mutual Aid. Um, and I am seeing some of the comments in the chat, keep them coming. I think it, it's our hope to be in conversation with you all as we are chatting amongst ourselves. Um, so just thank you. And I we agree, I think the Cosmos um, introduction um, is one that in our mutual aid community, we know and we love and feel grounded by. So the fact that we're able to witness it in a wider audience actually brings um, a really big piece of who we are and our ethos and how we try to build together with intention. Um, and a lot of that is also the place with which we try to heal and build um, authentically every day. So with that, um, Cosmos, I, I know this is a, a favorite saying of yours. I don't know if you want to give it context before I keep moving and maybe save me from chatting uh, overly as I'm already doing. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Yeah, we, we put this slide together and this was one that I think we said uh, we all found to be uh, true and resonated with us. Um, it's from Audre Lorde from 1984, and it says, coalition building is not easy. You don't make coalition because you like those in the coalition. You make coalition because none of us are going to triumph alone. Thanks, Cosmos. So with that, some folks that have been um, maybe following the mutual aid um, track and conversation as a part of um, CIFPAC over the last year know that we were in its uh, format last year. And so it felt right to come back to a welcome space. One, acknowledging that this amount of time that we have together is not long enough for us to talk about everything we would like to discuss under mutual aid. Um, last year's session for us which much more, was much more foundational. What is mutual aid? What are our principles? What are we envisioning doing? And um, in some parts, this conversation is an extension of that. Still very much, who are we? Who are we in unity? What are we doing together? Of the things that were on our to-do list, what is in our wish list, what has been the daily to-do list that we've done together in community. Um, but also I think given the overabundance of mutual aid and popular discourse by allies and philanthropy and, and so many um, different vantage points in, in, in conversation, it also made sense for us to be true to our journey, to bring you um, what have been some really amazing, beautiful triumphs of our year. But I think to also talk candidly in the context of collective care um, about some challenges, um, uh, challenges that are a part of movement building, that are a part of the mutual aid community. Um, I think to really one, forge a path for one, where hopefully you community member, wherever you're sitting and watching and, and listening to this, find a place for yourself here with us, which is our big hope, wink, wink. Um, but two, where there's opportunities for us to connect and have minds that are different and of um, all kinds of vantage points help us round out um, this practice because we're I, I think a lot of the times folks see this presentation and they go these people they know what they're talking about and yes to some extent because I won't minimize what we know but we're also community members that learn through iteration every single day and you'd be surprised by how much one new voice in our mutual aid community drastically changes our process our energy how we do things together all to say um, let's go let's let's start talking about principles and foundations so at its core, um, I, I do want to acknowledge there's a lot of slides here. We're not going to read them in length. We're not going to get through all of them. We really wanted folks to have all of this content to be able to review on their own. So just know that it's there for you. But at its core, um, mutual aid has been a practice that has been around um, in uh, civilizations and in communities well before this pandemic. Um, there's historical examples that we've discussed. Folks like to bring up the Black Panthers. They like to bring up uh, conversations um, from, from different countries and different eras and very, very much so. I talk about uh, formal mutual aid, right, where we're seeing hyper-organized, hyper-local networks, which is a lot of what we're discussing today. But there's also mutual aid networks that wouldn't necessarily call them that if someone on the street asked them, what are, what are you out here doing? Um, I, I think about the mutual aid that my mother did swapping for bean and rice with my neighbor across the street or the ways that we were asked to translate for other community members as peers, right? And I'm being told I talk too fast. So legit, yes, intentionally we'll do that. Okay. 
So um, talking about mutual aid and what it is, uh, we were grounded by three big principles. One, that collectively we can push for abundance and not scarcity, that there is enough resources for everyone out in this world, that there are structures that impede that and actively stop people from having what they need to live and subsist and thrive, but that the solution and the counter to that is rooted in community and in each other and in community-based solutions. Principle one. Principle two, solidarity, not charity. That we're not out here to replicate capitalism, racism, other structures that, again, stop people from having what they need, but also in themselves um, promoting the solutions that are, are caught up, for example, in nonprofit complexes or other complex, complexes um, really mean that our people in our community are pitted against each other are made to fit certain tropes, are made to fit certain kinds of reporting, um, are uh, meant to feel a certain kind of way about their relation to systems to get what they need. So we say that because the, 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 the core of what we do is community, it's each other, which means that it's solidarity. It's that understanding that we're doing this neighbor for neighbor out of a place of love, not for acknowledgement, not for personal gain, not for organizational gain, rather the we and the collective. And lastly, that because this is a community-driven effort, we are neighbors um, helping neighbors, period. Uh, we're not saviors. We're not better than the people that we're out here engaging with. We don't have all the answers. Um, again, we're neighbors, um, and, and, and in that format, we, we do this work. And so we've talked a little bit about broadly the three strokes of mutual aid life, but some quick principles that we'll discuss because we wanted to lay them out as things that to some extent we've been challenged with maintaining their full format in this year. Um, abolition, and that comes up for us. And not, I, I think a lot of people think about abolition specifically around the uh, prison complex, for example. But I think really thinking about what is abolition from larger systems is something that we um, think about a lot in mutual aid life. Horizontality, that there isn't one leader, that uh, all of us as a collective community um, have uh, power, uh, strength, voices, um, intelligence, wit, all of these talents that are needed. And so point is, there isn't one person that holds it all. We um, have to be unilateral about everyone having access to um, the, the voice and the determination to do what they would like to do. Autonomy that we won't be uh, electing um, things for our community members or even for um, other mutual aids, very much a consensus-based process internally for us, but to that anything for community is done with community and by community. Direct action, um, that we're not just gonna talk about it, um, that we're out here hearing from community members and that that means that we have to act with an urgency that is also grounded in community-based response. And lastly, acknowledging that our toolkit is why. Um, it can be very, very structured, there's specific tactics, but also acknowledging that a lot of them emerge based on the crisis that's out there, or um, the intelligence and creativity of our people, um, but that we will use any and every tactic that makes sense um, to advance um, our communities forward. Um, can I kick it over to Cosmos and Rihanna to help me fill in while I sip some, some water? I'm sorry. Thank you, Graciela. Uh, your eloquence is always magnificent. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I will do my best to talk about food sovereignty and in this case, autonomy and equity. Um, first, let me say that in addition to what Graciela said, uh, when, we, when we move from a, a lens of collective care and community care, um, I think that's rooted in something some might call radical love, um, really moving from the heart center and asking ourselves, how, how can we be better and how can we make our communities better? Um, food sovereignty, I think, is a bit of an academic term, but we are intentional about it. Um, and I, I think I said this the last conference, so I'll try to truncate. Um, but I'll frame it from the perspective of food security and insecurity. I think those are terms that are maybe more familiar. And so in Chicago, for instance, people talk about food insecurity all of the time, right? Um, I think the last stat I saw were like around one in five, 19% of Chicagoans were dealing with food insecurity, meaning they had to skip meals 
I think it's closer to one in three people um, in black and brown communities are facing food insecurity. So the response to that is food security, right? To try to get more access to get more food to folks, which I think is beautiful. The one thing that food security often is dominated by is the same people that have the same power, whether that's capitalists that have assets such as grocery stores or distribution centers, or whether that's policymakers that maybe aren't really in those communities. So usually the most marginalized of, of people have the least say into what they access. And that is where we are working to reimagine that. Food sovereignty says, hey, everyone should have a voice in what they're accessing. Food should be a right, not a commodity. It shouldn't be based on waste. It shouldn't be based on commodification of, uh, of a commodity. I said that. Um, and it, and most importantly, it shouldn't be based on systems that have harmed us. Um, one of those, I think, was highlighted through the slides, which is food apartheid. And food apartheid is, is specifically speaking to an intentionality, a deliberateness of, of our systems to, to uh, take access away, to take voice and agency away from people that most need it and, and often are the most marginalized. Um, so I think that gives you some perspective. The, the Chicago Land Food Sovereignty Coalition is a group of about 30 or more mutual aid groups. And so we've been working together over the last couple of years. Uh, I think we just made 14 months as a coalition uh, on February 14th. We started in December of 2020. And through that uh, experience, we've been really working to, to reimagine this, this system and these local and regional systems together. Um, I think I'll leave it there. I know Rhiannon has some, some more to add to this. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Cosmos um, and Graciela for giving that overview. Um, and as Graciela mentioned, uh, we we want to kind of see this presentation as a continuation from last year. And so, um, as Cosmos just said, we are celebrating 14 months as a coalition. And so we really wanted to focus on our triumphs and our challenges that we have had this year. Um, and so, I will start off, but this will really be a conversation with my comrades here. But I think our one of our greatest things, one of our greatest triumphs that we have built is our coalition. And I think it goes really beautifully in with the idea of collective care. Um, we have built this community of 30 quote unquote organizations because as Graciela alluded to, um, not, at, it's not just organizations, it could just be people, you know, helping out their neighbors and they are a part of our coalition. Um, but something that I think is really beautiful about um, mutual aid and this coalition, um, I don't want to say in particular because I'm sure all all um, intentional coalitions are like this, but we've we have built this community that really checks in on one another and supports each other, not just our neighbors, but those of us within this coalition. Um, you know, if if one of us is, you know, like in the past, I have been very open that I was struggling with my mental health. And so that's why maybe I wasn't getting things to folks as quickly as possible or even as slowly as possible, if that makes sense. Um, and my comrades were really great and were checking in on me and um, offering support in any ways in which they could and I felt comfortable. And so I think that is one of our amazing triumphs. And I think it's what undergirds all of this work. Um, I will pause and see if my comrades have anything else they would like to add um, in that regard or to move on to any of our of our other triumphs. I I think your point, Rhiannon, that first one about community is so important, you know, because I think especially for for a lot of us that do direct work in the community or you know feel I think very much the presence of the immediacy, right? Because I think we're we're doing wellness checks, we're talking to neighbors, we're talking to all kinds of people that are 
laying out their circumstances. They they lost their home yesterday. They haven't had food for two weeks. Um, they're about to lose the light on Friday if they don't have X amount of money, right? Um, and I think for us, um, it's very, very easy to get caught in the emotional kind of tunnel vision of, of what it is to, to stay in community with people um, to the point that I, I think that that element of community care for us is really important to avoid turnout and to avoid becoming and hardened or embittered in a way that means that we're not serving each other in community in the ways that we want and stay true to us. So that piece is important. But I think there's also this feeling when you're building something bigger than you sometimes, which is we, we definitely are that we have to build, we have to build quickly, we have to be the best. And I've been a part of circles where the process benefits expediency and not the humanity of the people building it or the, or the, the community out there. So I think to be a part of an intentional community that has those safeguards, um, that intentionally is thinking about how we slow down so that we build right, so that we do so with care in our hearts while we're doing the labor with our hands is really important. Um, but and, and I think it speaks to how healthy the community that we are doing this work with um, is in terms of acknowledging that there's going to be good days and bad days in this work, but that we're going to get through it together as long as we can take care of each other to be around long enough to do this in the ways that we want. Yeah, 100%. I'll just add that uh, that I, I feel like we have, a, a, along with the community care and collective care uh, that is exhibited across the, the coalition, um, there's a, a true lens of equity and and that's not true in a lot of systems that we're, we're actually contending with or being challenged by and that our neighbors especially are. So uh, there's just been a tremendous amount of love and care from across the city and, and even some parts of Cook County where folks are like, all right, let's let's make sure everybody's getting what they need, even if they're struggling with capacity, even if they don't have last mile support to get food directly to their distribution or, or maybe to a, a specific neighbor. So the, the fact that we're working together, I think it's just been uh, beautiful for many reasons, but specifically in this case around equity, which a lot of a lot of systems, as I mentioned, are ignoring at this current juncture in time. I'll pass it back to you, Rand. thank you. Thanks. Um, another one of our triumphs that we're just so excited about is our food hubs. We have now established two food hubs, food rescue hubs, uh, one um, in the Pilsen area and one on the northwest side. And this allows us to, and it kind of goes into another one of our triumphs is our, our robust uh, food rescue network. So the way in which we feed our communities um, throughout the Chicagoland area is via food rescue. Um, and it is, it is exclusively through food rescue. Um, and just quickly, I guess, for folks who are um, unfamiliar with the term food rescue, that means that we are going to grocery stores, to um, other food distributors, maybe pantries, and picking up food that would otherwise um, go to waste. So whether it is just kind of like on the brink of their expiration date, if it is excess food, um, we go and we pick that up and we bring it to one of our two food hubs. And so that allows us, and we have cold storage, dry storage, frozen storage, um, and that allows us to um, have a central location where, as Cosmos mentioned, all of our comrades can come together and pick up pick up what they need to take care of their communities. And whether it is people from the Northwest side going, you know, to, to Northwest Cook County and picking up food from a distributor there and taking it down to Pilsen, where then another one of our comrades picks it up and takes it down to um, South Shore or Roseland. So we're really, we're really grabbing, we're, we're rescuing food from throughout the Chicagoland area and then moving it to those places that need it most. And I will, I will pause and allow my comrades to add on. I think maybe just to say, you know, that the hubs also really came from a community intent and idea that um, 
community solutions sometimes mean creating something that isn't out there. And so we were operating out of U-Hauls, for example, and we were operating out of people's basements and all kinds of spaces out there, I think, to really try to cobble the, the vision of the food rescue system, as well as like, how can we safely deliver and get people the kinds of foods that they want? So I think the I think just to really add like testament and credit to like the long term vision in this, that was like one of the things that was said two years ago that we're finally getting to lift up um, in part because of a lot of the visioning and planning and hard work that, um, you know, folks have thrown into it. But I think also from this desire to stay true to the, the creativity in us that says like it's OK to build things that don't exist. Um, we we want to lean into the unknown. Sometimes that means we're signing a three-year lease while we're looking at each other being like, who's still going to be here in three years? Um, with like the hope and aspiration that we will be, or at least or I think uh, Cosmos points, our mutual aid ancestors and our, and our future uh, community members will be, and we'll have all kinds of uses and solutions for these warehouses that we can't even envision. Um, so I just wanted to throw in that piece as well. Uh, that's great. I, I don't think I have much to add. It, it's just been tremendous to see all of the, the, the amazing work in, by community members, by comrades, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think lastly, one of the main triumphs that we'd like to share with you all is the fact that um, our coalition and our, our comrades in this work have furthered the conversation about inequities across the Chicagoland food systems. Um, and in some cases that includes forcing conversations with um, folks in organizations that might not want to have them. But um, I think people are acknowledging the important work that we're doing and that we are reimagining re this work outside of the systems in which they currently exist. Um, and people are taking notice. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to add to that as well. I think uh, it wouldn't be me if I also didn't say that I think in the same way that we have visibilized uh, issues and solutions, I think we've also visibilized that this is a coalition and a mutual aid community that is here to stay. Um, that we live through lived experience, but that the last two years have taught us a lot about policy and process and structure and our creativity grounds, like how we make recommendations. But that that being said, um, we are gonna stay true to our community and we don't care who that means we, we talk to. That might change the tenor of the recommendations, but I say that because the accountability is strong in this coalition. Like we, we remember um, the promises, we remember what we've been told and for community benefit. And that's not to say that I think we will never, um, we always look at each other when a, when a partner comes along and we're in constant conversation with each other about like, is this the right fit? Is it a fit for the coalition? Is it a fit for the community? Does it need a need? But we're also thinking about um, the narrative that we're constructing for ourselves and other mutual aids through individual partnerships. I think just to say that it's as much about the conversations that we're driving, also the the amount of like strength and power that I think the, the mutual aid community has wielded in particular over the last two years to allow um, structures, philanthropy, anybody in this game to understand that not only will we lift up problems, we will lift up our solutions, but we will also lift broken promises to our community left and right. Thanks, Graciela. Yeah, that, that's really important. Uh, and I would further highlight that there's been times when folks have tried to kind of say, OK, well, can we specifically talk to this neighborhood or this autonomous mutual aid, which is fine. But I think as as we sit in the room when we're working from a coalition lens, we're like, well, no, we want to we want to highlight equ equity. And, and so talk to us as a coalition because we're all working together. And that that has been a healthy uh, healthy effort that maybe some might call a centralization of effort. Um, but in this case with the food system, it is so widespread, disconnected, broken, if you will, that we really do have to work together to, to really make it better. Um, I've said this many times, no one is growing enough food to feed their own neighborhood at this moment that I'm aware of. And the food system is so in, in the, dependent on transportation and, and shipping companies. So we really do have to work together. And it's been amazing to see that the coalition is, 
as, as Graciela said, is, is stay true to our, our values and our principles. Thanks, Cosmos. And I just I, I want to acknowledge the time um, and we want to leave um, some room for uh, conversation or questions. So um, we do want to touch on our challenges also. So, you know, it wouldn't it at first we were talking about like, do we just focus on the good? And then we were like, no, that's not real. And um, and that's not that's not collective care if we're not talking about the challenges we're facing and how we work through them. Um, so we have we have a few challenges. Um, and the first one is really around like how do we cultivate community care when some of those we're being served are being hostile towards our community. Um, and I think Graciela said this is it's community care doesn't mean that there aren't boundaries. And in fact, like boundaries are an act of love. So what does it mean to craft those boundaries with others in the community? And I don't know if Graciela or Cosmos, you want to add anything to this? Yeah. I, I think, you know, a lot of us, when we spoke last year, we were talking about the the ways in which, like, what were our touch points in the community? What, How were we having these conversations? Where were we having them? What were we learning? Um, and I think, you know, we presented a lot of excitement about the, the, the format of just engaging with community and being in community and, and listening to everything folks had to say. And I think... Um, for, for us daily, we're, put, we're placed in situations where how somebody articulates um, their universe to us or how they feel about what, what individual mutual aids are doing or um, items that they're receiving or what our limits as humans and as a mutual aid community, they present in all kinds of ways. For some people, you know, they'll articulate, articulate, articulate it as like, I feel bad about X. For some people, it's aggression. For some people, it's uh, total uh, disconnection. So I think for us, it's been in the same way that we acknowledge the need for a, a wide diversity of toolkit for like how we approach these solutions, that how community members will present their feelings about us, the work, the world around them presents all kinds of faces. So to say that we can hold that world while also acknowledging that we live in a plane where our mutual aid members um, you know, are, are battling feeling unsafe at points or feeling unvalued or feeling burnt out or feeling emotionally spent. So how is it that we, one, give lift up the truth of like how our community members feel and how they articulate it while also acknowledging that the receiving end of that mutual aid member might mean that they feel a certain kind of way. And how do we create space to listen and work through that in a way that holds the truth of the community member while also providing a safe space for the member that's helping that other person? Yeah, these, these systems uh, that this country was built on from its inception are, are always at play. And I feel like a lot of our fellow humans are often responding to the brutality and oppression that they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And sometimes that does get projected in different ways. I think the other challenge of that kind of uh, relationship and the way that you engage is that while we practice mutual aid and we're doing our best to be horizontal, I think there's still some level of privilege or different like uh, blind spots that I personally deal with when I'm dealing with certain neighbors. And so I inevitably have to ask myself, am I gatekeeping? How am I dealing with these resources and access to this network that we have? And how do we get more neighbors uh, that, that maybe haven't had the opportunity to have that same agency and voice how do we get more of them to to steward the same things that maybe we are and step back? And that's that's really a tough one to answer for me personally. But I think that's at play specifically because of these systems, how how things flow, pedagogy, whatever words you want to use. And I'll leave it there because I know we're pressed for time. Yeah, and I think kind of that uh, the systems, I think one of the things that we're also are we are faced with one of the challenges is um around like we all are conditioned to operate from a scarcity mindset and so what does that look like how do we help ourselves and help our neighbors unlearn that and come from this abundance uh, and work from an abundance mindset you know as graciela shared that is one of our core principles and so 
and it's hard, you know, it's hard to do that unlearning. And so how do we also help our neighbors um, try to reframe the way in which they're coming at things, especially when it comes to resources that have been scarce for them when they're living in a food apartheid? You know, how, how do we make sure that people aren't, you know, taking more than we think they need when we don't know what what's going on. I think kind of to Cosmos point that that unlearning that's happening. Sorry if I just put words in your mouth, Cosmos. No, you're good. I agree. Um, and then I don't like, sorry, best laid plans. We really thought we were going to have like 20 minutes for discussion comments, but here we are. Um, I think another thing that I, I I think it's important for us to lift up briefly while allowing some time, hopefully, um, for some questions or comments is we have had harm um, done within our community by our community members. And so that is a real challenge that we were faced with because we are human. Um, and so coming from the abolition framework, how, how do we how do we uh, repair the harm that's been caused uh, to one another, to our comrades, by our comrades, in a way in which upholds our community values and our values of abolition, while also ensuring that everyone feels safe in our community. Um, and so that is something that we have grappled with and probably will continue um, to grapple with. And I'll, I'll end there and see if anyone else has anything to add. Um, I think we maybe have some questions. Um, so I think we can maybe end the slideshow real quick and then maybe hear some of the questions. It says, who shops at the food hubs? Organizations or individuals? both. Um, so maybe I can get it started. Um, and I think say that the food hubs, one, have a model where we rescue in them. And so we're bringing items in and out of them every week, but we've uh, generally opened them up to both. There's individuals that come either to pick up um, for themselves or for other mutual aids or for, you know, uh, or events, whatever have you, through the mutual aid community. There's organizations that um, also come in, you know, are working with the mutual aid in some capacity. There's mutual aids that may not be a part of the coalition that decide to come through on a given week. So generally, um, we, we have that scale. Um, and we just encourage folks that are interested in um, receiving items to be in touch with us so that we can make sure that you can safely be connected. At the end of the day, it's still a warehouse. We just want to make sure people are safe. We, that you know that you're not tripping over anything you know the light switches that you have a way to be able to be matched up with someone to make sure that you know everything you need to know to be able to navigate what is there and how to safely do it um so if you're interested in shopping um you know hit us up and we will help you be able to do that How can we get involved in the food hubs, the coalition in general? Mo what's most helpful to y'all right now? Um, thank you, Jocelyn. Uh, this is one of our uh, calls to action. So um, we, oh shoot, what is our uh, website? We have a website with a volunteer intake form. Um, I think it's uh, Cosmos. You can, you can share that. Sorry, not to put you on the spot, but or if someone can grab it, pull it up. Um, but I think we're always in need of folks who can go out on these food rescues. It seems intimidating. It is not. It's, it, um, and we're always looking for folks to help out with that. So if you have access to a car, that is the um, biggest uh, thing that you need. Um, people getting involved with their own um, mutual aid group and helping out with those food distributions, uh, whether it's delivering food to your neighbors or helping out at one of um, the cited distros or taking food to those 
those food distros. And our website is shyfoodsovereignty.com. So C-H-I foodsovereignty.com and sovereignty, excuse me. And uh, I will see if my comrades have other ways to add to get involved because I don't think I hit them. I think you did great. Thank you. I, I would just add that, yeah, we can use more people power, as Rihanna mentioned. So I think volunteering for a variety of kind of activities would be good. Um, the physical labor, so to speak, is probably the biggest uh, capacity need because people often don't have time. And so we have to rotate quite a few people to, to go and pick up food with recurring rescues. We, if you can't leave the house for some reason, we also need people that are graphic designers, people that can do phone banking for outreach, uh, people that are good with numbers if you want to help us with accounting and fundraising. Uh, on that note, we can use donations of food. Um, so if you're a distributor, if you have a friend or a family member that's in the food system and, and you know that they aren't aware of us, but maybe have some food they want to share, we'd love to hear from them. We're going to always use funds as well while we're trying to navigate this world without capital, because we know that that's part of the brutality here is the inequity of, of resources and capital being land as well. Capital is a big word. Um, we we still have to navigate it. So as, as Graciela mentioned, we have a lease at two places right now. Um, we, we need to rent trucks. So our biggest expenses, I believe, are those two things right now. So if you just want to share funds, if that's the easiest way for you to contribute, we, we will gratefully take those. And maybe just really quickly to build, you know, obviously in our name, you, you're hearing our emphasis, and this is a food, a food policy summit, right? Um, council meeting. So our, our, our lifeline and our mutual aid or a lot of our organizing for us three and others is is food but i think just to lift up that in the diversity of toolkits there are other mutual aid comrades that we work with so that do all kinds of related work to what we're doing so there's like a belt squad for example that helps build like shelving and is thinking about technological solutions that help us refrigerate um there is uh, our folks that do jail support right thinking about like how do we fight abolition and and how do we reimagine you know directly through that outlet there's there's folks that are thinking about growing food and community connection through community gardens, for example. So I say that to say because, yes, all of those things, we need people power. We absolutely struggle with the fact that we need money at this moment to do it. Uh, we need muscle, literally. Um, that's why I, I'm, I build. I muscle build. I go to the gym. Um, but I would, it would be nice to not have to lift as much. But I say that because as sometimes it is having you literally at the table to think about a different approach, to think about, hey, is there a possibility for mutual aid to take this on as another solution out there in the community? So I think just to make space for ideas that um, folks haven't had the chance to lift up yet, just to say that the mutual aid community loves them and sees them and has a home for you. I'm not sure if we have time for any other questions. Um, which organizations do you recommend getting involved with in LA? Um, I do not know. I don't know if any of my comrades do. I don't know anyone off the top of my head, but I, Graciela, I don't know if you're going to say something. I was gonna say I happen to be from LA um, and I, there is a Los Angeles Aid Mutual Aid Network that my sisters work with. And so maybe we can take it offline to get you connected. Um, and there's also a, a great organization called Chirla. Um, I can't remember what it stands for, but they also do work, a mutual aid work through an immigrant uh, uh, trans organizing lens um, that might be interesting to look at as well to see what, what, what folks are kind of connected with, but happy to connect offline to get you connected. Are there any other questions? Oh, here it comes. Has there been any crossover of mutual aid into policy making at local or state level? It's a great question. Uh, I don't know that I have an exact answer. I can say that I feel like in conversations some of us have had, we've definitely found that we've been at the table with certain policy makers. Um, and I think some of them have, uh, given us audience and I think we've made some influence in how they're thinking. I don't know if that's directly like translated in the legislation. Um, I would say we're a little more resource driven. Uh, I think resources are more immediately needed. 
um, and more critically needed like today. I actually had a conversation with a state senator here in Illinois one time on a panel and she was recommending that we take it down to Springfield and put a bill in. And it, that would have taken like six months to get money for what we were talking about, which was food on, on the ground today. Um, but to that end, I think policy has its place, especially when you're trying to work with a bunch of people in a collective space, right? Mm -hmm. So having shared agreements like we have is, is monumental. Um, I will leave my editorial for the rest of Illinois state laws to some some other conversation. Uh, Graciela, were you about to say something? Yeah. So in my professional hat, I do policy work. And I say that to say that, like, I, I don't know if the person that asked this question was asking, like, if we're informing legislation or we're passing bills or we're organizing folks that way, um, which the answer is no. But when I take a look at the legislation that's been proposed in Springfield over the last two years, I see our community touches all over it. Um, when I see the fact that we're trying to make period products free, I see the work of the Chicago Period Project and a lot of the work that, I'm, or that our mutual aides have done to make sure that hygiene products are available to all folks that need them, regardless of uh, gender, sex, or ability to pay, right? Um, when I start seeing proposals around how we can make sure that food isn't able to be thrown away without a community access point, I see the conversations that we're having here around food apartheid and like, what are the solutions, right? So I didn't just to say that, like that isn't like a very direct thread between like where we're going out to legislators and saying, hey, this is the issue. We think legislation is the solution. We're happy to like see it through as a community member. But I think for us, like, the, the, the reality that our community member needs those items now to Cosmos's point about why we're resource driven, but why we're always happy to inform and expand elected a universe of like what they know and solutions is like game. We're going to do both. Like we're going to give you the context and like we're going to tell you what you think you need to go do, fix it, and then be like, right now you go do it. Um, and then we're going to continue doing the thing we got to do with our community member. And at the same time, a lot of us in mutual aid uh, those conversations with our neighborhoods and our community people, the next extension is popular education and for some is political mobilization. Uh, so we haven't really talked about that here. There are some threads in, in, in mutual aid where that's a, a much more strong linkage. And for Beaumont Cregan, that's one that we're building out as we speak um, because all of those structural things that we're providing for people are things that have been historically vacant and missing in Beaumont Cregan as, 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 as much of all of Chicago has been of a face that way. So for us, we've heard people say to us, yes, give us the things, but also how do we make sure that the next generation doesn't have this issue? So for me, if they're lifting up policy, then you know we'll, we'll see some of those direct linkages. But again, we'll have that be community driven, not driven by me, the policy wonk, or by us as mutual aid that has an elected that comes to us that says, hey, we'd like to partner with you on policy. If community says that we do it, but other than that, we won't go to it just to go to it. And I'll just um, add, well, I'm just going to speak it into existence. So I think Graciela uh, alluded to a, 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 a law. It was passed in California. It was part of a larger kind of like, um, like food waste, I think, law or composting. But part of that was that um, if grocery stores can't just throw out uh, excess inventory they have to offer it up to community organizations so food rescue so i think it would be amazing if the state of illinois did that if we just start at the local level at chicago but like we can get that done we can make that happen and like i'm using the royal we here so um i think it was sb 118 i'm not 100 sure in california but um let's make it happen i'm putting it out there i'm speaking it into existence um all right, here are our calls to action that uh, we already kind of talked about, but here it is for you to see. Um, uh, Cosmos or Graciela, do you all have any parting words that you would like to share with our beautiful audience today? I think just to express gratitude, you know, for the time that folks had spent and the interest. Um, and I think it was like our desire to both continue to expand and complicate people's notion of what mutual aid is and our experience going through it with everyone. So just thank you so much. And that I also hope that the conversation about the, the challenges and the triumphs that we've had, I think that folks can also see that as like 
the biggest extension of community care for us because it means that we're in a place where we're centering that in our community and amongst each other to the place that we feel healthy, that we can think about a future together while also trying to deal with a present that is really, really hard and difficult sometimes for us, but knowing that as long as we can continue to center each other, we will get through that. Um, and we'll get through this and we will get through the next U-Haul and we will get through the next compost and we'll, we'll get through the next time that I have sweet potato in my hair with Rhiannon in a car. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah, I would, I would just add that uh, a lot of these things we're talking about that we can't fully discuss in 50 minutes are why questions. Uh, why is my neighbor dealing with this issue? Is it because they are dealing with the immigration system? Are they dealing with the carceral system? Uh, are they unhoused? You know, there's all these intersections. Uh, food sovereignty, food security doesn't exist in some silo, right? And, and I think we touched on that a little bit earlier. But I mean, I, I think it's important that we really acknowledge that all these things overlap. And in fact, here in Bronzeville, we just had a conversation with. Uh, we do direct aid as well. And so we're, we've been getting inundated with rental requests. And so uh, we're like, well, how do we do things that are pop up and we do deliveries with food on Fridays? How do we engage with neighbors there to also get like more solution based uh, conversations at that space? Um, how do we talk to neighbors about maybe facilitating conversations about this um, so we're not the ones brokering every conversation and creating that imbalance of power? So I, I think that I would love to continue those conversations with anyone here. Um, and I know that my comrades are already doing so. So uh, if you're interested, get at us and, 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 you know, let's talk about how we can make this world better. Thank you everyone for attending this. Uh, we hope that you will join us um, on our food sovereignty journey, um, whether you're here locally or if you, um, you know, are in LA or anywhere else, hope you find ways to get involved and take care of your community and take care of one another and yourselves. Um, but yes, thank you all so much for being here with us today. Hope you all have a beautiful rest of the day and um, beautiful, beautiful week. Much love y'all, appreciate y'all.